So, I'm Kobe Beaton. Uh, I work for AWS uh, as my former colleague here. Thank you for joining. I'm, I'm pretty happy to be here in person. I think I haven't spoken in person for more than a year and a half. Uh, I'm based in Munich. We'll talk about a little bit about myself in a sec. Uh, and this session is Kubernetes Lessons Learned. The idea is uh, I'm working with strategic customers across EMEA and uh, worked with them and there are some scars on my back from, from large-scale Kubernetes clusters with customers. And I wanted to share those with you. And maybe those will help you. I'm sure that I'm not going to surprise you probably in most of those lessons. But I was surprised on how customers are approaching uh, or adapting the uh, on learning those uh, uh, lessons and which mechanism uh, they implemented to make sure that those will not repeat, uh, or even prevention and mitigation. Hence, I created that particular session. If you want to talk to me, I'm, I'm, I'm a Twitter. Uh, I can also share my email. And opinions here expressed are solely mine, and not any view of my employer. I have to say that. Now we can start. <laughs> so that's me, five years old, 22 years in the industry, 10 years in AWS, multiple roles. Uh, mainly tech executive roles. Uh, I act as a uh, specialist CTO for customers in AWS. I consider myself a disruptor and mentor. Um, uh, I've managed and built many teams of architects, and nowadays I, I'm enjoying to work with the top strategic customers. Uh, when I say strategic, it's, if I have to break it down, it's customers who, for example, serve hundreds of millions of users across the world and have lo pretty large deployments uh, in, in anything, not only Kubernetes, whether it comes to data and analytics, etc. cetera. Uh, above all, I'm a proud father uh, and uh, a proud husband. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, people ask you what Kubernetes is. So it's not just a container orchestrator. I always say it's a microcosmos, right? Uh, <laughs> it's like something b inside something, right? So, so basically, it's, uh, it's, it's so funny that uh, I call it a miniature universe. Right? It has its own APIs, its own networking, its own storage model. Uh, and life are not easier nowadays for application developers, because now they have to reason about infrastructural parts as well with Kubernetes. Right? Uh, when, you go, when, when you do a function on, uh, when you write a function and you throw it on either Lambda or any other function as a service for that matter of fact, you don't care about anything. But suddenly when, when a developer comes to Kubernetes, Kubernetes is not that good in connecting the infrastructure layer to the application layer, if you ask me. If you have a code and you want to run it, it's pretty tough there. Yeah, so we have Fargate and, 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 and GKE auto, uh, GK auto clustering, et cetera, and these are all nice, but, you, but once you get to a certain scale and you're running containers on compute, it becomes really complex. And quite honestly, I don't think that nowadays we still have a good, con a good layer to connect between the application, the developers, and the infrastructure that challenges that Kubernetes comes. Yeah, maybe service mesh is a start, if you ask me, but it's a start. It's just bringing the application, the networking into the application layer. That's how I see service mesh. But it still lacks the understanding of which stacks am I running on top of that, how would my Go code run. Uh, so that's, this is just my, my, my impression with those little bit islands of uh, Kubernetes as a microcosmos. Yeah, so uh, enough me, five years old. All righty, the first lesson. <laughs> Sleeping with the enemy, QProxy and IP tables. Who hasn't been beaten from that? Raise the hand. <laughs> oh, that's not a lot, okay. So I don't know if you know, but uh, the core Kubernetes networking is actually rely on that pretty old school technology called IP tables in the kernel. Uh, it's a pretty strong, when it went out, it's, uh, uh, it implements a connection tracking mechanism in the kernel. I actually wrote a few things to there, and uh, this is pretty, pretty strong. And uh, QProxy, what you know in, in, the, the, uh, what you know in Kubernetes is, is, ba is basically implementing a proxy that uses heavily 
uh, the IP tables mechanism, generating your cluster IPs range, for example, how you communicate between pod to services, doing all this Kung Fu DNAT table pre-routing, those of you who work with networking. And that means that your nodes that are busy with connections per second will be tracked by a table on the kernel side. And the default parameters on the kernels and the connection tracking table are quite not generous if you are running busy clusters or busy workloads. It doesn't have to be a cluster. People tell me, Kobe, uh, I have a cluster of uh, 100 nodes. That's not a big cluster. Yeah, but it depends on your workload. You may have a workload that is running huge amount of short-lived TCP UDP connections which are being tracked. And you will wake up one day at 3 a.m. and you will find yourself with intermittent failed connection, not understanding why. This is one of the reasons. And if you do a D message on the node, and it doesn't matter where AWS, Azure, GCP, it's really not, doesn't matter where, your physical data center servers, you will see that particular message. And when you see that message, eh, the pot, and you probably see a downtime, intermittent downtime. So what can we do to overcome that or to even reason and understand that? There are a couple of things we can do here in the post-mortem that I've worked with my customers. Uh, first of all, monitor the con connection tracking table. That's pretty important. It's really easy to monitor that. Right? You can graph that in Prometheus or whatnot. That, will, that gets into the category of prevent and early detection. Second, not less important, understand the root cause. Don't just monitor, understand the root cause as SREs. Why did my table got exhausted? Maybe I have this bad code that someone wrote on a low level inside the container that is doing actually a TCP half scene attacks because he doesn't know how to use the libraries. It's your responsibility to understand what was the root cause for that. And I'll tell you why in a second, a couple of things ahead with other customers. As a rapid fix to mitigate when you have that problem when you woke up, consider to increase the connection track. You can increase the connection track table that tracks the connections and generates that problem. But don't increase something because you don't understand after that why did you need to increase that. Because you're going to meet that problem again if you have a culprit pattern. And don't try to increase that from the CCTL on the node. Kubernetes is a microcosmos. You should do it through QProxy parameters. That will sustain reboots and whatnot. Other customers I work with as an architect, we use dedicated node groups to solve that problem. How? We simply dis decided to logically group very busy connection per second applications, and we'll talk about that soon, uh, on, on an application that you must run on your Kubernetes clusters, such as core DNS, and we'll get to that. I'm bridging to the next slide. But if you have a workload which is uh, has a tendency to create that problem, try to segregate it into a specific node group with pod anti-affinity rules and make sure that there the contract table will be high. That's, that's the best practice I give my customers. Try to solve it architecture-wise and not SRE-wise. Don't deal with the problem, deal with the root cause. Ask the why and segregate that. Make sure that you keep the Linux kernel OS up to date. The IP tables and NetFilter are modules that gets fixed, gets fixes and performance. Do that, don't run on old kernels. Your Linux networking stack is super important when running Kubernetes. Yep, some customers that I work with now testing a new technology called eBPF. How many of you are familiar with eBPF? Anyone running it in production? Let's chat after that, I'm interested. So I'm, I'm doing a session really soon on Cilium and eBPF in AWS. Uh, and uh, eBPF will solve that. With eBPF, you can ultimately get rid of QProxy and IP tables, right? You can do it to do with IPv IPVS mode, but that hasn't seemed to catch quite a lot of tension because it has a lot of still open issues there. And the compatibility with QProxy and IP tables still remains the best compatibility, but with those limitations, as just show. eBPF is here to replace 
the whole idea of kernel networking. I'm not going to get into that in that session, but think of eBPF as a networking stack that lives on the user space instead of the kernel. So enjoying both worlds. You can look at the kernel, what's going on with your packets, and talk to the Kubernetes API at the same time in a single program. Protect the program. <laughs> not where you were thinking when you did core DNS, right? Yeah, OK, it was the DNS, right? Nobody believed when I, when, when I worked with my customers who said we had an outage of core DNS for five times. I said, what? This is like the 17 technology from DARPA in US. What's wrong with DNS? It's always working. No. Core DNS is a critical component for service discovery in Kubernetes. Um, you may wake up one night with intermittent, intermittent fail connection, DNS client resolve error in application timeouts. And that can happen, not only because if you have a networking issue. Uh, it could be the pattern that I've seen with customers is a cascading failure pattern, not an immediate pattern. So you start to see teams saying, hey, I don't know why this, we deployed like a new code two weeks ago, and you ultimately say as an SRER, it's probably something with your code. And we see some uh, connection close, disconnections, it takes some time to, to connect between those two microservices. It's, it can be really tough. I had a customer who took six months to understand in a huge cluster of 1,000 microservices that eventually it was timeouts for DNS. Because you have to monitor that, and even if you monitor core DNS, you have to monitor and do a unit testing to make sure that your DNS performance are not hindered. It's a pretty complex word, DNS in Kubernetes. What can trigger that particular problem? Lesson number one, remember the contract table? I mean, DNS queries are tracked, folks. They can kill your cluster, yes, and they can kill your DNS resolution, so it's like an inception. You might have overloaded core DNS pods. Out of the box, they come with a simple CPU and memory. How do you know that you're not killing those, right, in terms of performance? Monitor that. And you might get into a connection rate limitation. I'm not going to get into it, which cloud providers, but some cloud providers might tell you, hey, there is a limit to the amount of DNS packets that the interface can handle. So think of spreading those workloads across multiple in a horizontal manner. DNS can scale really well horizontally. There's no reason, you know what, let me go back. There's no immediate reason to run vertically scaled DNS power, unless you have a very specific use case. If you're rapidly scaling in Kubernetes clusters and you have core DNS replica on those, that could cause intermittent connection. Think of it, right? Core DNS are spread there, you're, you're doing a scale in, right? And it will scale in, will kill the core DNS, and until new ones get replaced by the replica set in the deployment, you have vulnerability to a small-scale DNS capacity on your cluster, right? I know it's, it's very weird to think about that, but Kubernetes has a lot of moving parts behind the scene which we simply don't think on. And core DNS out of the box, folks, it's a configuration for my son. Two replicas without affinity. You understand that? Two replicas. It should be, performance test says that it can do thousands of pods. But again, what is your use case? Who tested that performance, <laughs> right? Maybe you have this application which is completely using crazy DNS without a cache. Then two replicas, let alone in a single fault domain, could cause a lot of harm. And we'll see how we mitigate that. Yeah, let's, let, let's see a simple representation of this cluster with core DNS. That's like a typical cluster where you have DNS clients. DNS clients, it's, I refer to any pod that uses DNS, and all pods use probably DNS if they communicate with services, and pods around the world or, or any other egress connectivity outside to the internet. So you start, this is the default, by the way, Kubernetes, two pods of core DNS that no one knows if they're going to hit the same node or not, right? That's the default deployment, right? Uh, and that's funny, right? And this is where the problems start. You should have seen a red circle, but the background is not good. So just, take it, just focus on the QBNS to replicas. Uh, that's not good, right? So what do we do? Right? We have a few things to do. We can 
The first thing to do is to scale the DNS. There is a thing called DNS autoscaler. So that's the first thing you want to do in all your Kubernetes clusters. It's like HPA, folks, only specifically for DNS. It can grow as your cores or your nodes are growing through the cluster lifecycle. And this is what it will do, simply add additional replicas of cube DNS or core DNS. Cube DNS is just to, remain, to keep the naming convention uh, before core DNS. So that's your first thing, scale that. But it's, is it the only thing? I would argue that not. The next thing you want to do, and you don't see that on the slide, unfortunately, is to also set what we call pod anti-affinity. You don't want all the core DNS pods to hit certain nodes. So how do you do that? You can, you can add a pod anti-affinity on the host name, and that will equally, or supposed to equally spread them as uh, designed to the best effort across multiple nodes. So these are the first two things I would do. Yeah, but is that all you can do? No, we talked about separating core DNS in, into a, its own dedicated node group. So this is a setup, a really simple, an, an extension to the, to the slide you just saw. We're creating a specific node group, I call it the admin node group. That's a very familiar pattern with customers that I work with. They take all the admin, all the cluster autoscaler deployments, all the ingresses, right, controllers, all the operators, and they use dedicated virtual machines just for that particular purpose. Why? Because normally they can control it better there. They can control when they scale out, they can control when they scale in, how they scale out, how many replicas, and it's probably one of the best patterns I've seen if you are running really large clusters and you want to control your operational environment. And you do a taint and tolerations just to make sure that no uh, not related pod lens. Don't do node selector. Node selectors are where you place pods in nodes. They don't repel them, right? Taints and tolerates, you actually repel pods. You say, hey, dear pod, you, you don't belong here, right? So taints, tolerations for all the administrative. And don't be shy. Use network-based instances. Go to those who do really good networking, not do really good necessarily CPU or memory, right? Because you need network. Network needs high packet per second. So do the design well, and it's not hard to do that in Kubernetes. And then what you can do, you see the DNS client, you can run them on spot instances, right? Or any other cheap compute. Why? Because you don't care if they die with the core DNS on them, right? Because you have this admin layer there which has the core DNS, right? So you can, so eventually this is a cascading event also for a better architecture, which is also most cost effective if you ask me. But is it enough? Yes, for most cases. But if you have a really busy cluster with really busy DNS, let's say that you are scraping the internet for machine learning algorithm and, and, and you have this immense of data that you need to download from various websites, this would work, but this means that you will have to add more and more core DNS, which could be expensive. If the internet would work without the cache, we would be doomed. When you do Google, the chances that you actually get to a server that serves you dynamically is slim to none today, right? That's what you should think in Kubernetes and DNS as well. So if you have a DNS killer application, you'd want to look at node local DNS. Node local DNS, in its simple term, let's not complicate it. It's core DNS the same. It's from the same manufacturer, as we call it today. And it's just implementing a first cache layer for DNS on the node level. That's all. It's a daemon set that will run core DNS. And I'm not going to get into configuration. You can grab me for a coffee or at lunch. And I'm going to chat a little bit more about that. But basically, think of that the first DNS call doesn't go to the DNS virtual IP or the cluster IP. It first goes to locally to a DNS instance and caches the result. So if there is a cache hit, it will simply not even go to, not even use the con connection tracking table, folks. It will automatically get that from the local replica. And if there is a cache miss, only if there is a cache miss, you don't see that unfortunately the background here is, but there is an arrow, it will actually hit the core DNS service endpoint, right? And this could be extremely useful in killing connection tracking issues because local DNS calls are not tracked. 
But it has its drawbacks, like everything in architecture. You have to balance things. It uses host networking. I don't like it security-wise. So your node, your, your, your node local DNS pod, will have full access to the network namespace of the node. Mm, and people like me don't like it, right? You have to understand the implication of that. And moreover, this will add extra load on every node, right? It's another pod that you have to manage and also monitor, right? So think about that. Okay, post-mortem, DNS autoscaler, node local DNS, dedicated node group, and all the things I talked about lesson number one. <coughs> Done with animations, let's go back to my PDF. So you wake up at the night and then Something is wrong with your cluster. You don't understand. You look at core DNS, you look at all your monitoring system, and you have all those fancy tools, and you still don't understand what's going on, right? But you see the manifestation. The manifestation is really interesting. You start to see that worker nodes are getting into not ready state and getting into ready state. You're doing cube cattle, exec log, and in, and, and you see in, in, intermittent API errors there that you're not able to complete that. You check the network, everything in the network looks okay. The network guy wakes up and says, hey, it's your problem. You know, it's not always the network, it goes back to sleep. But you were smart enough to understand that the API has a limited capacity in Kubernetes to serve requests, whether it's read or write. And if you had a graph, that graph would do something like that. And maybe something went wrong during the night and some kind of an operator or that, that you've installed because it was super cool. You looked at the CNCF website, you installed that, and it's working really great, but you didn't understand that this actually lists your clusters, objects, every two minutes, right? And there is a machine learning job that needs to understand the completed status of the pods, and it happens in 3 a.m., and this is why you woke up. Uh, I can't, sorry? Sorry, yeah. So here is a representation of this cool operator that you installed. But if you look at the code of the operator, or you read a little bit the readme, or you take a look at even the API server logs, you will understand that this operator installs as a daemon set on your 1,000 nodes. And every few minutes, it's actually doing a list of all the pods to get status of the pods. Yeah, that's pretty cool. But when you do a list on objects in Kubernetes API, Right? You get all the information that you don't need. You may need a single uh, uh, status there. So uh, the lesson here is try to understand when you install operators and daemon sets, what do they actually do and what is the impact on the API? If you have operators which are listing uh, as daemon sets, this could be uh, uh, quite critical. My recommendation, try to stick to operators which are uh, uh, if, if they have to do list, at least from a single instance and not a daemon set, maybe a deployment, right? But that could kill your cluster if you don't understand that. And it could be also Fluentd, because if you use Fluentd to enrich metadata in your logs of the namespace and the pod name, it will need to contact every log entry. And some uh, 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 early code base didn't cache that information. So you can imagine that if I have one. 2,000 logs per sec, and I have to go 2,000 times to get this information. And then you say, oh, I need to buy new servers. My APIs are choking. No, you don't need to buy new servers. You just need to cancel that particular metadata, or just say, I want the metadata only on the pods that are running on that node. What can you do else? There is another verb called watch. And in architecture, software architecture, you don't want to list things. You want to get a state, and then get notification when something has changed. You shouldn't pull change, change, change. No, that's bad architecture. A good architecture says, OK, I get the state. I watch and I say, oh, there is a change. What is the change? I integrate the change in my cache and in my database. And from time to time, I'm doing a reconciliation. I do a list because I need to understand that I'm on the correct path. Kubernetes has the watch API. When you're doing kubectl minus uh, W or M, I don't remember, it will actually watch, right? You start wait the there, and if you scale the deployment, you will just see the change that has been changed. This is what, th th these are the operators that you should choose to work with. And if your developers are developing code that connects to the API, have, the, have a chat with them on watch instead of list. Because it's very easy for them to get this RBAC rule 
and they can list, and then you go back and wake up at night and say, hey, what's wrong here? And this is not operator from CNCF only. It could be a machine learning job that someone wrote in your organization that needs to understand the job status. So he says, oh, let me connect to this API called API server in Kubernetes, get this whole data. Oh, it's easy. Yeah, but there's other things which are racing uh, and competing on the resources of the API server. Yeah. Uh, for the post-mortem, so dive deep into the code. Don't just install those operators and say, hey, that works. Understand the impact. Scope the list and watch, right? So if you need to list a certain pods, why do you need to list all the pods in the cluster? Maybe it's a specific namespace. Maybe it's only a specific deployment inside a specific namespace. So always try to scope. Monitor the API servers and metrics. And I don't care what you use, guys. Dynatrace, Honeycomb, Grafana, I don't care, Batch. Make sure that you understand the, your number of in-flight requests, what is the cap, and whether you start to see errors. It doesn't really matter how you do it. And last but not least, Kubernetes has added recently something called API priority and fairness. You can actually say, mm -hmm, that particular service account that I've just did for this operator cannot do more than that. That's pretty cool. Take a look at API priority and fairness. Next slide. This is going to be really quick. How many of you happen that you have a cluster, they bootstrap a new cluster, it doesn't matter, Terraform, Palumi, CloudFormation, whatever, and the cluster was broken. Everything looked okay, you couldn't schedule pods. How many of you? Oh, you're good, guys. You're good. You're either good or am I bad? Yeah. So I've seen that quite a lot. And I call them silent failures. You know those times when you install Kubernetes as a control plane and data plane? So you bootstrap the control plane and sometimes on certain cloud providers or or platforms, you have to push like this environment variables, right? For CNI plugins, right? And, 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 or there's the bootstrap process that starts with kubelet and you have to pass parameters, right? How many of you understand what happens if you don't pass a parameter? So if, for example, you don't pass a custom networking parameter or it fails in AWS, you won't be able to schedule pods if you enabled custom networking. And in Azure, it could be the same. And I've seen a lot of cluster break because you can't really code everything for failure. There are certain failures that will simply uh, knock your cluster out uh, and you will not be able to schedule. Uh, uh, and this could be also things like a taint that you wanted to put on a node group and this operation failed. That means that you might see like very weird application running on your super expensive GPU instances. You probably don't want to do that. So how do you mitigate that? Um, this is the next slide. I'm just gonna go over it really fast. Just decouple the control plane and the data plane bootstrap process. If you're doing an automation, I don't care which tool I presented here, Terraform, but bootstrap only the control plane, pass all the parameters and all the configurations that you need before you start to deploy the data plane. Have some kind of a function as a code or an external process or a local exec Terraform resource that will validate that all the configurations that you want to be there are actually there. And only after that validation hook, go ahead and call a Terraform template or a stack that will actually bootstrap the data plane. Don't waste control plane expensive time if something went wrong. Now, I have customers who go beyond that even. They have a CD pipeline. When I say a CD pipeline, you already have a CD pipeline, most of you here, that is actually testing whether the cluster should go live. They schedule an, a pod and say, okay, that pod got a network, it can do DNS, it can do the egress, and it can connect this to this third party that we've just configured with the control plane. We've got those four tests up and running, cluster is good to go. So this is just an architecture I've built for my customer together with a brainstorm. Next slide, please. So decouple control plane and data plane bootstrap process. It's a prevention, it's a design. Insert validation hooks. And don't care what you use, guys. I'm not here to say use Lambda. Use whatever you want to use. Use Bash. Just make sure that you're doing some kind of a validation code. Connect to the API server. It could be a Python, an OJS that just validates the things that you wanted to validate. And do a functional test, a continuous deployment. Again, this could be a very simple deployment as like a, a bot that deploys a pod, gets the metadata of the pod to understand if you got a network or if the Elastic Network Interface was connected, the second one, into the virtual machine. Right? 
These are secret break and break it. Use secret breaker mechanism to break if it's not working. Yeah, and this is the last uh, lesson that I learned from my customer. Multi-tenancy in Kubernetes. I'm not going to go a lot on that, but you got to be kidding me. Kubernetes was never planned to be a multi-tenant orchestrator. Folks, I want to wake you from a dream. It's a single tenant orchestrator. I'm sorry. I know that I work with a lot of SaaS providers who are still trying to augment Kubernetes to be a multi-tenant, but it's not. So uh, what kind of a manifestations I see with customers? I see customers who didn't understand correct Kubernetes and multi-tenancy and got vertical attack vectors with untrusted tenants, especially CMS systems. Oh, I have this uh, application that the customer uploads something and can run this script on the pod. <laughs> oh, so you have a privileged pod. Hmm. You know that he can connect beneath to the node and kill your other customers. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's not a sandbox process, you know. It's C group and, and trying to understand Customers can't really understand it, and I understand why. It's a completely different thinking that, uh, uh, that even if you secure the vertical attack vector with policy as a code or anything, uh, your tenants can move laterally. And I will show you an example here. If you can, next slide. This is the best example that I explain customers. This is the slide that I show my customers. When they say, Kobe, we want to go multi-tenancy. Oh, you want to go multi-tenancy? Oh, you're doing namespaces. You think that this is the end? No, it's not the end. If you have a customer bound to namespace A, his pods can run on node A and node B, right? Unless you're doing an affinity here. So on the pod level, you can do at least an affinity. And that's the red text that you don't see beneath there. It's easier. But what happens when your pod needs to contact the API server? The API server is a shared resource in a multi-tenancy cluster. Yeah, you can do RBAC but it has some sharp edges there. The only thing I'm saying, think before you let your customer do multi-tenancy. And there's a big difference between customers and SaaS and internal development teams. A big difference in the security exposure and whatever it needs. Uh, next slide, and it's probably one of the last slides that talks about post-mortem. Work top to bottom when it comes to multi-tenancy. Don't offer multi-tenancy without understanding what the application can actually do. Call the guy in the room and say, hey, does the application allow the tenant to run an untrusted code? The untrusted code means that an active code inside the pod. If the answer is yes, then this is not a good candidate for multi-tenancy. Challenge those and tell them, okay, maybe we should separate that in a different architecture. And I've been in a lot of those discussions and they end up with an isolated environment, some kind of a bus with a queuing system that connects between them. That's far better secure. And take the onion approach. Don't let customers go with SAS workloads without policy as a code, such as OPA or Kiverno. And yeah, buy some runtime protection. It's not the end of the day. You can use their open source offering, but the runtime protection products out there are another layer of defense that if someone escaped a container, a, an attacker, there is still this runtime protection. So yeah, if you need to do that, and use built purpose-built operation system as last mile. Amazon, for example, has an operating system called Battle Rocket, just Google as well, and Azure. Those operating systems are, have, we've invested a, um, billions in trying to mitigate the attack surface if someone is able to break. But again, this is not a cure. This is just if some mechanism fails, A, B might save you, taking the onion approach. And isolate, appetize team for customer. It also depends on the appetite of isolation, I call it. If it's developers and you want to isolate them, hmm, it could be okay as a security policy not to, to get yourself, knock yourself, your head in the door uh, and, and have a more relaxed. But work with the CISOs, try to make sure they understand that you don't end up like these folks in this uh, vector. <laughs> and these are, this is the last slide for my presentation. These are a few insights I, I collected as an architect in this area for the last two years. Kubernetes doesn't fit well for application workloads. If you have a request response model, 12 factor microservices, it's a beauty. But if you have data stream applications, state application, application that needs to write with databases, think twice whether you want to do it with Kubernetes. Databases are for administrators, pods are for developers. Service meshes, are still a start. It brings the application to the network, the networking to the application, but they have long implementation times 
And sometimes they are not well understood. If you need to discover services, you don't need service mesh. Service discovery is an element within a service mesh, not the opposite. Just a, just a thought there. EBF is a paradigm shift. But don't run to eBPF if you have IP tables problem. Go to eBPF because you can get great observability there, a more secure approach. And I think this is the last slide of my presentation. So I want to thank you all for that. I hope you enjoyed.